it is quite difficult to find good online sources for researching the golden age of piracy. The waves of the interwebs are haunted by hacks, content mills and general scalawags. Worst of all being that uh, golden gunpowder fellow. <laughs> A definite pearl among the sand is the website piratesurgeon.com, probably one of the best online resources for researching the period. I've used it myself for uh, producing several of my videos, and as the name implies, the website focuses on uh, period surgery and medicine, but also covers reenactment, which uh, the author has dabbled in. And uh, so I figured him a perfect candidate for an interview, so here we are. Uh, this was actually a very pleasant conversation, uh, a bit more casual than my uh, usual interviews, uh, and, it was, and it was also very easy to edit. Most of what you will be seeing is the raw recording of our session. Anyway, uh, I hope you'll uh, enjoy it as much as I did, and uh, without further ado, here's Captain Raphael Mission of the piratesurgeon.com. So uh, the whole room, actually, you can only see like the, the stuff on the shelf, but the whole room actually has a pirate theme. That's pretty awesome. Do you have, do you have a flag also? No, I do not have a flag. Um, hmm. I, <laughs> I, I didn't, when I first put the room together, I wasn't part of any pirate reenactors. So I didn't have a flag per se, but actually now I'm part of the Mercury crew and we do have a flag. In fact, the guy that put it together, he's really big on flags, so mm. we have a, a very authentic, or he's big on authentic, authenticity, too. So we have a very big, I mean, huge flag that I helped paint, believe it or not, for events. And uh, I don't have a copy of it here, though. Probably one of the best online resources for researching the period. I've used it myself for uh, producing several of my videos. And as the name implies, the website focuses on uh, period surgery and medicine, but also covers reenactment, which uh, the author has dabbled in. And uh, so I figured him a perfect candidate for an interview, so here we are. Uh, this was actually a very pleasant conversation, uh, a bit more casual than my uh, usual interviews, uh, and, it was, and it was also very easy to edit. Most of what you will be seeing is the raw recording of our session. Anyway, uh, I hope you'll uh, enjoy it as much as I did. And uh, without further ado, here's Captain Raphael Mission of the piratesurgeon.com. So uh, the whole room, actually, you can only see like the, the stuff on the shelf, but the whole room actually has a pirate theme. That's pretty awesome. Do you have, do you have a flag also? No, I do not have a flag. Um, mm. I, <laughs> I, I didn't, when I first put the room together, I wasn't part of any pirate reenactors. So I didn't have a flag per se, but actually now I'm part of the Mercury crew and we do have a flag. In fact, the guy that put it together, he's really big on flags. So mm. we have a, a very authentic, or he's big on authentic, authenticity too. So we have a very big, I mean, huge flag that I helped paint, believe it or not, for events. And uh, I don't have a copy of it here though. So if it's painted, is it uh, is the flag made of silk? It's canvas, actually. Okay, okay. Cool. That was back at our first event in 2007. Uh, I just showed up to this event for the first time ever, and that was what they were doing. I was a day early and said, hey, we're going to paint a flag. So I said, all right, I'll be part of that. Okay, awesome. Yeah, no, I think uh, I could really imagine it, like, just behind you, like, hanging up the, uh, the flag. That would really look really awesome on the webcam, I think. Then you wouldn't have to identify things. You're going to go through and identify all this stuff. Uh, I see. I see this, and uh, I'm, I'm going to do it a bit subconsciously, probably like sort of look at everything here now and then. Uh, so far, I managed to find the crocodile. Uh, I also found your iconic hat, of course. Yes, my hat. Oh, so you read about the hat? Yeah, I think I've seen a, a few years ago. I saw a previous interview where you talked a bit about the hat probably that's funny i've only ever done one interview because hmm. a lot of the online stuff is so it's just not right <laughs> you know they they don't do the historical research the way you do hmm. which is why i thought that's why i was probably a little bit cagey when we first started <laughs> talking okay. I, you know, I don't, don't want to do one of these things where you know they, they get all their information from the general history and that's it but you do good research and you, you've oh, got you. notes, you've got footnotes, you say where you get stuff. I think that's fantastic because so many people don't, you know, and mm. I want to know where does this come from? Right. 
so I can go look it up and maybe use it. Yeah, no, right. It's uh, it's definitely something I appreciate from from your website as well. I think I mentioned it as well that I use it for research uh, quite often, every now and then. Uh, and it's nice, of course, to see like what th- there was like this really fun incident actually where you talked about um, uh, shaving, you know, and you had a quote from uh, Shellwalk. And I looked it up in my copy of Shellwalk and it didn't in- include it. So I was like, is there something wrong? And it turns out my copy, which I have, is, is an abbreviated version and for some reason. And they said, oh, like, wow. we cut out the unimportant bits and they cut out that bit, which I thought was very important, which talked about, you know, the way they shaved. But I, ma- I managed to find a different it, version, it, which had all of the stuff. Half of the job of doing this is digging. Mm. Because you start out with something and you think, oh, I, I've got this source. Then you look, I, I have a, a source called the Navy Surgeon, which I've relied on quite a bit, but it's a 1742 source. He did another version, which I believe was 1735. I may be wrong on that, but um, that's probably a little bit more accurate to our time period. Mm. And unfortunately, you know, I went through and used this source a lot in 1742 because it was the only one I could get my hands on originally mm. in Oh, now I've got all this information that's like, oh, man, did I go back? Do I, do I fix it? But it's kind of like you just want to keep going forward and adding things. So, Right. Uh, yeah, and in the beginning, it was crazy trying to find sources in the very beginning. Oh, yeah. No, I like, can, uh, I can relate to that. 2008, 2007, actually, I was looking for the uh, uh, book. Oh, I can't remember the name of it, but. It's like the book everybody talked about, and you couldn't find a copy. And I finally had to go to a public library at a university. They they had public access. They had one little computer, like well, off in this corner, like you could go over there because you're not part of the university. So I go over there and I was able to download that book and I was just beside myself, like, wow, I actually have a genuine resource from the period. And from there it just snowballed. Now I've got like thousands of them. Yeah. No. Uh, no, that's really that's really good, and uh, um, of course, what's good nowadays compared to, I mean, just a few years ago is you know we have way more resources online on stuff like the Internet Archive and such, which is and you you see stuff uh, every day. You know, people post like tell me, oh yeah, they uploaded this document, like uh, journals and stuff. It, it's really quite amazing. Yeah, it's fantastic. And today, it's just so much better, and they just keep adding to it. So, yeah, definitely. Well, that's why I've got so many sources now, because now I can get them easily. Used to be I'd have to go to that university. Like first I was going there every three months or so and then a half year and then every year. And I'm like, you know what? All this stuff's around. I can just pick it up off the Web. And then the, the real trial there is in reading it, because a lot of people don't want to sit there and read this arcane uh, uh, text because you don't understand the words and that's the that's another big part of doing this research it's like okay sometimes i have spent an hour searching for a word like what does this mean what does this mean and you search everywhere till you finally find something right but it's part of it you know yeah no definitely and also you might you might notice sometimes i uh, i'm gonna be sort of looking down a bit just because i have a little notebook where i have my interview questions uh, oh, that's... And also, I'll, I'll probably be taking a few notes and uh, sort of improvising a few questions if some sort of idea comes up, or if you say something, I wanna, uh, I wanna elaborate on or such like that. There yeah. also seems to be, um, well, the sky seems kind of clear now, but there was some thunder before. In case I suddenly go out and get hit by li- lightning or something, I hope, hopefully, I will not be. But you never Absolutely. know. Um, but anyway, I guess we can uh, sort of start the the interview itself. And the first question is. Um, um just kind of if you if you can introduce yourself to us like who are you and what do you do well my pirate name is Raphael mission my real name is mark kehoe and i'm actually an engineer i do uh, mechanical engineering right now my degree's in electrical engineering but uh that's what i do i work with my dad we have a company together and we do engineering work for the glass industry so I have a real technical background. I also have uh, my MBA and I went and when I got that, I, I wound up doing a lot of reports. You had to do a lot of different reports for the classes. 
And the teachers always said, you're such a good writer. So that's why I, I love writing. And that's part of the reason I developed the style that I did, where you do a lot of technical research. No, that's uh, that's very interesting, actually. I don't think I've heard that before about the technical background. And do you think also, because um, I'm thinking like in the period, they often wrote in this very sort of technical technical manner, sort of very straightforward. So you think, do you think there's a sort of like correlation there, or sort of relevance to the way you write and the way you research and your, your background? I, I never put that together, but <laughs> I actually like the way they write. Because so often you, you start reading something, you know, some of the books I have are fictional and you get kind of looped, you know what I mean? You, you mm. get kind of confused, like, oh, this this isn't as clear to me as mm. the last book I read. So yeah, it I like the straightforward, you know, present the information and then makes it easy for me to take it and put it into a format that I hope is useful to people who are looking, you know, because my original goal in creating the website was to create what I wish someone would have created for me when I decided I was going to be a pirate surgeon reenactor. I wanted something that would explain how do you do an amputation? How do you do head surgery? And nobody had done anything like that. There were just all these books out there that I found over time. Yeah. No, and um, of course we talked now a bit about your articles, but what, and you have a, you have a website, of course. And uh, would you tell us a bit more about it? Uh, it's called piratesurgeon.com. I registered it um, 2007, I think. And I originally created it to do journals of events. I used to do these really goofy journals of events. And they're very tongue in cheek. They're very humorous. They're full of pop culture references because I like pop culture. It's yeah, the pop. Austin Powers. I, I saw that one. There's all kinds of, I mean, Mad Magazine, you name it, anything yeah. that catches my fancy, Raiders of the Lost Ark, whatever. So there's all kinds of that kind of stuff. And I started doing that, and people started asking me questions about the surgery part of it. And I thought, well, I'll, I'll put together an article and see how it goes. And people liked it. And over time, the, the articles kind of didn't really fit with the goofy event journal, so I had to separate them. And I took all the goofy event journals and I put them on my personal website. But yeah, the Pirate Surgeon website started out to just be something funny for all the people that hung around piracy.pub, which was a forum. It's still a forum, it's still around. And uh, it's, it doesn't get quite the traffic now with social media, but I was actually doing uh, accounts, brief accounts during the day. I would run back to my hotel room and I would get on the internet and just write what was going on and post it on the website and people were all fascinated with it well the event ended and all these people started posting all these pictures because everybody takes pictures of the stuff because they're so proud of it and i thought this would be a great article you know put these pictures get permission of course i'm big on getting permission and making sure things are are on the up and up i i don't like stealing images and uh got their permission put them together with the accounts, embellished them a little bit, you know, added some materials. I thought about it and that's how it started. But then it switched over because it's like I say, I wanted this, I wanted to have a book that would explain to me, how do you do a surgery and what are the tools for it? What tools do you need to find? Because you don't even know until you find out, well, what were they doing? The, the tools from the period are very specific and mm. some of the designs are different even from like 20 years later. So I was looking, okay, what, what kind of tools do I need? What are they for? How does this work? What are the steps? So that's how it really came about. But the only thing about it is I created it back in the day, back before we had social media, back before everybody was using, you couldn't even use your phone, I don't believe. Back in 2007, I'm not sure if you get on the net. I'm not real sure, but we didn't have that. So I developed it old style. And now there's 500 pages of that plus, and to change all that into something that's convenient to a phone would just take untold hours. I have done it with another website, my company website, which I do. And it, that has, you know, 15, 20 pages, and it took me a long time. So to have to do all those pirate surgeon pages, I just thought, wow. So I actually got a, a comment from somebody 
probably about a, a year ago, and they said, your, your website is so great for an old fashioned website or an old style website. And I thought, is, is this a compliment or not? <laughs> but I mean, it is what it is. It, it, I can't really go back and, and fix it. It'd be smarter if I take the material and turn it into a book, like I always wanted to. For all the people who want to be pirate surgeon reenactors, hmm. or even like a little bit later period, a little bit earlier period, because it, it's very broad, a lot of it. Not all of it. Some of it's very specific to that time, like I said before, the tools. But yeah, that's that's my website. You got to suffer through it. If you're on a phone, you're probably not going to enjoy it as much because it's a little bit hard to read. It's just not formatted correctly for a phone. But uh, you know, someday there'll be a book and we won't have to worry about it, right? Yeah, no, I've actually never considered it because I always do my research on, on my computer. But... I mean, I can also relate because I do have a slight background in web web development, so I know this sort of hassle with uh, adjusting the uh, the website to fit on different screens, and not only phones, also like iPads and different different screens and oh, all yeah. that. And then the right. elements just jump around everywhere on the screen. It's quite a hassle. And see, the the real problem with all of this for me was when I originally created it. I have. When I was in college, we had an a engineering magazine that I just, I loved it. I used to work on it, and I stayed with it for years and years. Well, magazine layout's very static. You know, you 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 have the layout, and you put the picture here, and you have the text there. And, mm. and that was how I was working on the website. When I originally put together the website, I was thinking magazine layout. Well, of course, all that's really, really changed now, and it's it's just not what I did is not conducive to converting it to phones and tablets and so on and so forth. Mm. And it's a shame, but on the plus side, I don't think the AI likes it as well. So they can't go and steal all my material. <laughs> At least that's what I hope. I tell myself that. Yeah, that, that would be kind of funny if we see some sort of return to the old web style style in the future, just to avoid, you know, the AI taking over our stuff. That would be quite amusing. Yeah. I mean, I do, I do like the old style uh, of the of these sites. It's quite charming, you know. Kind of reminds you of the of the old days of the internet. See, is that a compliment or not? <laughs> it's, it's definitely. It, uh, I should. Oh, I, I'm, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I get you. Okay, well, that, that's it good. It sounds funny. It's like, oh, your website's so old fashioned. <laughs> like, oh, thank you. I think. Uh, but oh, it's fine. But you you said of course that the uh, the background for the uh, for the website was as uh, firstly it was a journal to describe these reenactment events and bef 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 before the journal it were of course attending these events so um, how did you sort of get into this reenactment slash living history in the in the beginning? Well, we have to go back a step actually. I in two thousand and two, yeah, it's two thousand and two. I. I was looking for something new to get involved with. I had been involved with uh, another forum, and I was sort of like, okay, I'm done with this topic. It, I, it was Star Wars, actually. I was on the Star Wars website, and I was really into uh, the collecting side of it, and I used to write articles and on and on. But eventually, it's like, you know what? There's, there's only so much you can say about this. So I thought, I want a new topic. And so I started looking for information on Captain Nissel, uh, the French captain who's in the general history of the pirates, actually it's in the second book. And I was just fascinated by him because he was an interesting guy. He wasn't so much a pirate as a philosopher. So I was looking for that and I wound up on this site called Pirates Info where they were talking about him. And I thought these people are kind of fun. So I hung around Pirates Info for a while. And then I started researching it with them because they were doing research. And of course, I found out Captain Misson, he's fictional. Unfortunately, there are a couple of fictional pirates in the general history, and he's one of them. So that was the end of him for me, because I was more interested in the historical side of it. And I hung around there till they made me a moderator. And I was a moderator on the Star Wars forum, and I was a moderator on the forum before that. And if I hang around any place too long, they seem to make me a moderator. Now I'm a moderator in the Facebook group that Ed Fox started. So it just seems to happen to me. So I was a moderator. This other guy comes in and he's telling us all we're not doing our jobs right. And he was a previous moderator. So I got kind of like, okay, 
it must be time to move on to a new topic because I don't need to be told how to do this. I want to do it my way. So I was about to leave and Ed Flax came to me and he said, hey, there's this other website over here. It's called Piracy Pub. And it's more about reenacting than it is about history. But I think you'd enjoy it if you tried it out. And I, I really don't want to see it, you know, just disappear on me. So I joined it and over time got interested in the whole reenacting thing. And, and this is this is kind of strange, but I'm a type one diabetic. I've been a type one diabetic since I was three. And I had a doctor at one point tell me, he said, hey, I asked him, I said, you know, how long am I going to live? And he said, well, you should live to be at least 25. And I thought, 25, you know, I, I don't know how old I was in probably like 12. And I thought, I'm going to do better than that. And so we were, uh, we were actually doing the Ouija board thing. Well, I told you this is kind of involved. And the Ouija board said I was going to live to be 40. So I thought, okay, I'm going to live to be 40. Well, I was turning 40 in 2007. I'm on this piracy reenacting website. Now that, you know, if this is the last year, I'm going to go do something completely uncharacteristic. Because remember, I'm an engineer. I'm kind of conservative as far as, you know, like I don't do wild things for the most part. So I thought, I'm going to do this. I'm going to just jump into this 2006. I'm saying, you know, for my last year, if this is going to be my last year, I'm going to join them and do this. And I went and I just had a blast. And like I say, I would run back to the hotel room and I would write what was going on because like, I can't believe this. This is just so bizarre. And they would had the they had this pub thing at night that they did inside. It was at Fort Taylor in Key West. And I'd I'd been going to Key West for years because I just think it's a fascinating place. And so when I went down there, I I didn't know much about the fort. And they would have this pub in the fort. And I swear to you, I swear it was like being back at the time. And I was just so amazed by it. And I think you, if you go back and you find that first uh, Surgeon's Journal I wrote about it, the Goofy Surgeon's Journal, you'll probably get a sense of how amazing I thought it all was. And that just hooked me. So long story, but basically I came from like research and just thought this is something I'm gonna do. And of course now I'm well past 40, so that I'll, the Ouija board is not to be trusted. And uh, that's where I am today. I haven't done as much reenacting lately. In fact, it's been a couple of years because you just kind of give move on to other things eventually. But there is an event that I'm considering in December that, that the Mercury crew has put together that sounds pretty cool. Uh, you talked a bit about uh, Captain uh, Misson, as you as you say it. Uh, I know there's like a bunch of people Maybe. say a bunch of different versions of it. I think Miso is the French probably the correct one, but um, uh, who? The, so you sort of adapted him into your into your own character, Raphael Miso. Uh, would you tell us a Actually, bit more about him? Mission. It's Raphael Mission, and Mission. the reason is because when I joined that Pirates Info in 2002, I misspelled his name because I thought it was Mission. Mm. So I'm actually not Captain Misson. Okay. I'm oh. oh, I see. Well, okay. well, yeah, would you tell us a bit more about him? Like, who is this uh, Captain Mission? Uh, well, he he was this pirate captain. He was, oh gosh, it's been years since I researched him. He um, He decided to become a pirate and he was trying to get people he, he had a very uh, political agenda he wanted to you know help the people help the, the sailors to oh gosh it's been so long <laughs> anyway they established this community on libertalia called libertalia on madagascar and they lived there on madagascar and they established this like very egalitarian community and he had a priest that was with him who i always thought was kind of fascinating fascinating too his name was uh yeah Caraccioli, right and he would kind of egg him on and he would like give him a lot of the philosophical side of it because he was a former priest he quit so you you got a lot of people here who are very involved in the philosophy of you know we we need to be free people kind of thing and that was 
that was my understanding of it. I just like the whole idea that, you know, the, this is a thing that appears often in the pirate uh, discussions. The pirates were these people, you know, they freed the slaves and they, they, uh, they, they made sure everybody had an equal share and all this. And as you research it, you find out that most of this stuff isn't even really true, which is unfortunate, but that's the way it is. It's, it really, they did keep slaves and everybody did not have an equal vote. And all of these things you learn as you go along, but you don't find that out unless you do the research. So, but Captain Misson was, I mean, he was like this heroic pirate who was very into the, the positive element that a lot of people associate with the pirates. And he eventually died at sea, as I recall. But like I say, I researched him and then about 2004, I'd figured out he's not really real. So I didn't put a lot more time into him after that because even like the details, if you read the account, you see there's not a lot of detail in there. Whereas in the other pirate accounts, you do find a lot of detail. And that's what I'm looking for when I do research is details I can use to discuss health and surgery and well-being. So poor old Captain Misson got kind of cast aside. Right. And who is and how and who is and how does he diff your your character mission? Who is he exactly and how does he differ from uh, Captain Misson? That's funny you ask because I was just telling somebody the other day, nobody cares about your backstory. Um, I don't have a real well sketched out backstory for my character, believe it or not. But my presentation style is like my professional style. I'm an engineer, it's very direct. I don't try to be a persona, an actor, but to give you a thumbnail sketch of how I perceive my own character, he must have a French background because his name is French. And Raphael means healer from God. I chose that very specifically because I wanted a character who would, you know, had a healer name. So that's why he's he definitely got a French name. And I chose a French name on purpose because I said, well, Misson was French. You picked him. You're French. But he's a surgeon who was captured by the crew of the Mercury crew. I said that twice. Anyway, he's a, he's a Mercury crew member who was captured. Being who I am, I would never join pirates. And I knew that. So I thought, well, I'm going to be the perfect captured surgeon. This is something they did back then. When the pirates caught a ship that had a surgeon on board, if they needed a surgeon, they would take him and they would say, okay, you're going to be our surgeon and we'll let you go when we capture another ship with a surgeon on it, which is kind of funny because now you're this guy, you're in this role where you don't want to do it too good because then they'll never let you go, but you don't want to do it badly because then they'll just kill you. So I figure he's one of these guys that's biding his time. He can't wait to get off somewhere and be able to get, you know, join the regular community and the regular sailing community and be a surgeon for a merchant ship. But of course, I've been with the Pirates now since 2007, and we're in 2024. So I guess I failed at that. And they just like you too much. Yeah, apparently. <laughs> they keep trying to get me to go to events, so they must like me a little. Do you, do you have your own Caraccioli? No, I do not, which is, I wish I did. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, that would be uh, quite an interesting companion. But you could have like a sort of little sort of plushy parrot or something, or even a, a plushy Jesuit or something on your shoulder. Well, the, the skull back there, I don't know if you can see him with the, uh, with he's got the tricorn on. Mm. They weren't called tricorns in there. <laughs> but um, he, he was my companion for a long mm. time. I take him to the events. Plus, you can kind of show how head surgery was done on them. And he wasn't very expensive, so I don't mind if he get destroyed. So. Yeah, and he, he probably isn't able to complain about being used for that purpose no. as well. He's quite a willing candidate. I have actually had people volunteer. There are some mm. photos somewhere on that huge bunch of uh, journals, surgeon's journals, the goofy ones, where somebody volunteered who was bald so I could really show how this worked oh, well. without doing that's well, awesome. Doing it, of course. <laughs> no, and of course you have uh, you have your iconic hat. Uh, do you want to tell us a bit more about it? 
Yeah, actually, most of the elements of my quote unquote character come from that first Key West event in 2007. And this is one of them. Hmm. Uh, when I got on the group and said, okay, I want to go to this event, but I don't know how to sell. And I don't. And it's just not one of my skills. Had I done it, it would have been terrible and I would have looked nothing like correct. And I was really interested in being historically accurate versus, you know, the, the movie pirate look. I really wanted to be historically accurate. So fortunately, somebody stepped forward and said, oh, I, I will do my, your clothes for you. That was uh, Michael Bagley. And he did. He did a very good job. In fact, he made the first pair of, of pants for me and they didn't fit. And he actually made me a whole nother pair, which I thought was just magnificent of him. But one thing I really wanted was a cool hat. Now, I, I mentioned to you when we were talking before that um, I like Raiders of the Lost Ark. It's one of my favorite movies. So I was kind of looking for a fedora type hat that was still accurate. And Patrick Hand had made this hat that was a planter's hat. It's got, if you can see it back there, I don't know how well you can see it because I can't see my own image, but no, it, it's looks, got it looks great. Very okay. wide brim. It's almost like a Lee Van Cleef in the good, the bad, and the ugly type hat, which I also liked about it. And it's it's got a very, very wide straight brim. It's for keeping the sun off you when you're a planner. And everybody said, well, this is historically accurate. I'm not sure exactly how true that is. I think it might be a little bit earlier period. But I love the hat. So I said, Patrick, can you make me a hat like that? And he actually had done a, a display on the Piracy Pub, how he did it. He'd done a post showing exactly how he did it. He used a coffee can to make the top of it. And then he just basically starched the, the edge of it. And he said, yeah, yeah, I'll make you a hat. And I said, well, what do you want me to pay? Oh, you can just get me a bottle of rum. So he shows up at the event, at the Key West event in 2007. I said, did you bring my hat? And he said, well, I didn't have time but I'm gonna give you my hat that I created for myself because I think I'm done with it. And that was the Patrick Hand hat. I always call it that in the, the, the goofy journals, they call it the Patrick Hand original hat with a trademark symbol on it because I felt it should be trademarked. Patrick created it. He had this whole explanation on how he did it. And I just thought, you know, this needs to be recognized. So I would always put that in there anytime I mentioned it. And I always spell the whole thing out because I wanted everybody to know Patrick Hand, who was like, he was a, a revered figure on the Piracy Pub. And I wanted everybody to know Patrick had made this and he does really good work. I like to let people know, you know, who does good stuff so that hopefully I can send some business their way if they're interested in it. So that's the story of the Patrick Hand hat. It kind of went on from there. It became a thing where everybody wanted to wear the Patrick Hand original hat. And you will find in my journals, especially the later ones, a bunch of images of just different people with the hat on. There's even a picture with, uh, with Ed Fox. I went over to England because I really wanted to see some people over there. And there's a picture of Ed Fox wearing the Patrick Hand hat. So it, you know who Ed Fox is, correct? Of course, of course. He's a very... about him, you know, everybody knows Ed. <laughs> so yeah. It's kind of funny. I went over there. He was working on his doctoral thesis when I was there. And he, he you know, he told me this. He said, I'm, I'm super busy, but I want you to come out and visit me. And I said, well, I don't want to get in the middle of that. I know how important he said, I would be insulted if you didn't come visit me when you're here in England, even if I'm working on my thesis. So because we had been friends all the way back to Pirates Info, you know, back in 2002. So I got to hang around with Ed Fox for a day. He showed me some really fascinating historical sites that had nothing to do with piracy, but uh, but he did wear the Patrick Hand hat. Oh, There's it's... a lot of stories about the Patrick Hand hat. It reminds me of another one that I won't tell. Uh, you also mentioned the uh, uh, the crew you're involved with, the uh, crew of the Merc Mercury. Mercury. Uh, would you tell us uh, a bit more about them? So William, it's, it's kind of funny how the 2007 event is such a key thing, at least in my history. William, he went by the name William Redway, but his real name is William Pace. He had created this crew to create a historically accurate 
for people who are at least trying to be historically accurate crew of people at the Key West event. And the Key West event had a lot of kind of party pirates, uh, movie pirates. And I'm not trying to denigrate them because they're fantastic people. I had a great time with them. But he wanted to create something historically accurate. And that was the first event, I believe, I could be wrong here. He might have done it in 2006, but I'm pretty sure he and Patrick had talked about doing it for 2007. And they created this Mercury crew for people who wanted to do historical stuff. So there was a little group of us. I don't remember how many. I want to say like five or six of us at that 2007 event. And it kind of grew from there. And like most pirate reenactment groups, it has waxed and waned over the years. But it's always kind of been there. And anytime certain members of us, like Michael Bagley, who I mentioned earlier, if he comes to an event, he typically is part of the Mercury crew. William is. There's a number of other people as well. But uh, it's it's got a core group of people that do a lot of stuff together. Have you acquired a, a ship yet? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's that old slogan about a ship as a hole in the water into which you pour money. It goes <laughs> twice as much for those tall ships. I, I knew uh, the Royalist. You know who the Royalist is? No, sadly not. He, he's gone. Um, but he had a ship that he would take to events, uh, you know, a real tall ship. Mm. I don't know if it's truly a tall ship, but uh, it was, I think it was at least a two-mass ship. Three, I think it was a three-mass ship. But he just finally had to give it up. They're so expensive to maintain. And particularly if you sail them in warm waters, you have a lot of trouble with them. But I think in general, they're just, any ship is very expensive. So no, we don't, we have a ship, it's called the Mercury, and I've seen pictures of it on paper. And that's as far as it goes. Right. And uh, so the average day on a, um, on a reenactment event, what does it look like for uh, Mission, Raphael Mission? Basically, I, I have a bunch of stuff that I've acquired over the years. And I have a lot of tools. Some of them are accurate. Some of them are reproduction. Some of them I've actually had made for me. And I take them all, set them out on a table. And I just, people will come up and I you know, say, hello, is there anything on the table you'd like to hear about? I can describe any procedure. I can explain to you what any tool does. And that's how I do it. And some people are kind of casually interested, but other people, I've had some people just stand there for 20 minutes asking me about, I had a little kid come up and he, he didn't say much. He just pointed to a tool. And so I explained it and then he pointed to another tool. <laughs> and so and he kept doing that. And finally it's like, oh boy, am I gonna have to describe everything to you? But he finally, I think lost interest, but he did maybe went on to become a surgeon, I don't know. But yeah, that's kind of what I do. I do that all day from the event opening to closing. Um, sometimes people come up and help me out and take over for me, which is always kind of entertaining because I they pick up what I say because you, you kind of get a pattern going. You, you learn how to say things so that people are entertained. You don't want to keep them there with just a dry, boring dissertation. You want to give them something kind of fun and hopefully some little nuggets of fact that they can take away and maybe maybe mean something to them. But that's what I do. I do that for the entire day. And usually if there's a reenactment, I go out with the reenactment and I take my clister syringe, which is a very large syringe used to give enemas. And I run around the battlefield and threaten everybody who falls down to say, okay, if you don't get up and you're getting a clister, you'd be surprised people get up. I guess you wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> Do you have any sort of uh, special, like uh, special events or like procedures or anything which you carry out or, or mock procedures? I guess not, not actual procedures. You know, I I never I've seen them done, and I've seen them done pretty well, but they never look real to me. So I always kind of felt like, and this is going to sound strange, but. In a way, I kind of felt like it was dishonoring to people who actually did this because, I, you know, you see somebody like, and it's not their fault. They'll get somebody on the table and they're going to do a mock amputation. And the person just kind of lays there and doesn't say much. You're like, 
if you had a real person there, they'd be screaming bloody murder. They're getting part of their body cut off. And so it's just, it's too many factors you can't control. So I've never really done um, like a, a mock surgery other than, the, you know, like I said, there were some images of me doing a pretend surgery at somebody's head, but there was, it was mostly a photo op thing so they could take some cool pictures. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, the one everybody always wants to hear, of course, is the amputation and how that goes. And so I described that and I like to talk about the head surgery, but it's it's funny. Some of the, the the little things that are interesting, like shaving. I think shaving is kind of fascinating because mm. it's a big deal to shave yourself. Then you wouldn't do it, so the surgeon would shave people, and I think that's interesting. And I've gone out of my way to try and get some accurate razors. The reproduction, of course, because to get a real accurate razor, I don't know if you even could, but. I, just little details like that or how they weighed medicines out or just things like that that I think are interesting. I don't want to give people a lot of information on stuff that doesn't interest them, but I do like to point out something there. How you would amputate a finger, for example, that there's there's a number of ways to do it. And one of them's a saw, but that's got to be the worst one. Can you imagine someone hacking away on your finger with a saw? Right. There's these little nippers that I have that they would just take them and you'd nip them off. They, they, all, they look like blacksmith nippers. And that, to me, seems like a better way. You, there's also, of course, the chisel. You could just take a chisel. and That would probably be the fastest way. But just things like that. You know, things that people don't think about much. That kind of stuff fascinates me to explain. Plus, the the thing I was telling you earlier about how the pirates would capture a surgeon and then they would promise to let him go. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting thing. I didn't know that when I started researching this. So, yeah, all of it's kind of interesting to me. Right. What is the what is the best memory you have from uh, any of your reenactment events? Oh, wow. You know, it's mostly after hours, just mm. things that happen after hours when you're hanging around with everybody and you're drinking and you're having a good time and just weird things that the, the Patrick Hand original hat got stolen. And a couple of women, one in particular, Michael's actually Michael Bagley's wife, Jessica, went out and she found it <laughs> and she went up to the guys who had it. They, they're just a bunch of drunk guys. We were in uh, Putin Bay, which is kind of like Key West. It's a it's a drinking town after night. And she went up to the guys. She grabbed the hat and said, "You shouldn't take what's not yours," or something like that. And then she stalked off. I mean, that's a great story. There's just all kinds of great stories of things that happen after hours. And that was what I tried to put into the journals. Was you know, some of these just fascinating things that would happen at night. Um, I met the guy who he was in charge of archaeology for the uh, the museum down in Key West, the uh, Mel Fisher Museum, and he was really interesting to talk to. So that was something that happened in an event, and he gave me some some ideas, and we talked about just different things that he had found, and we talked about the history, and really interesting discussion. So just. Like I say, there's just all kinds of little memories everywhere. And it's funny, I'll go back and like look at my own journal sometimes because somebody will somebody will express an interest. So I'll say, well, go look at this. And then I think, what did I say in that? And I'll go back and read it. And there's all these great memories that I don't remember anymore in my own journals. So it's kind of funny. You go back and you read it and you're like, wow, I had a really good time then, didn't I? No, the sort of uh, sort of off script stuff, I guess you guess you could call it. Yeah. No, awesome. Uh, so, sort of going back a bit more on the on the website and all, sort of into the uh, behind the scenes stuff. Uh, how did you go about exactly creating your articles? Like, what what sort of a, and and what sort of inspired them? Was it like did you have like an idea from the start? Like, this is what I want to write, or was it more like you did your research and you found stuff and then you wrote an article about it and. How did it, and just the just the process itself, what did it look like from start to finish? I, I actually have a very particular process. I started out, like say, I was looking for books. And so then I started actually getting hold of these books when I found out I could get them from the university. 
And I would read through them. And as I read through them, I would like mark off parts to say, well, this, this is an interesting, this is about head surgery. This is about uh, amputation. This is about how surgeons were treated, what they did on the ship, what was day to day, what was the food people ate. I mean, all of it, health and well-being, surgery, anything that interested me. And then I would go back and I would actually type that stuff into a Word file. And so I began, I used to read all these books. I probably read about probably 30 of them, 30 surgical books from the period that I thought would be relevant to what a surgeon would do on a ship. And I got this file. Well, that file now is, I don't even know, it's several hundred pages in Word. And now it takes so long to load that I can hardly work with it anymore. But it's all divided into categories of things that I wanted to write about. And, you know, if I read about a surgery that would be done at sea that I hadn't thought of, I'd say, okay, create a section on that. That's going to be a, an article someday. So I have this huge file divided by topic. And when I go to write an article, I take that stuff out of it, put it into another Word file so that I can manage it, because otherwise it's just so slow to work with. And I read through it, organize it. And then I start looking at my books that I haven't read through. I've got a number of books that I've not read completely through, but what I've done now, now that we have better technology, you can actually go through using, uh, using Adobe and you can turn everything into text. And granted the text, uh, the OCR stuff is not real great for the old stuff because it's written in that old style. It has a little bit of trouble, but at least it gives you most of it. And so if I'm, let's say I was writing about am amputation, for example, I would take my material, organize it, get kind of a general outline of what I wanted to do. And I try to do it procedurally. You know, like first you would be doing this and this and this and kind of go at it from that angle. And then I would go into these other books and I would look and see, is there anything interesting in these that might add to this, might provide a little bit of detail. And this became particularly important for the articles I've been writing for the last couple of years, which have been uh, like medicines, uh, food, the alcohol they drank. Uh, and the food is divided into multiple different articles, you know, like uh, vegetables and fruits and so on and so forth. But you need to go outside of piracy. You need to go outside of sailors. You need to start looking at things that were written by scientists so that you can give an appropriate amount of detail. But so then I take it all and I just start writing and I go through uh, topic by topic. The problem with this is sometimes you'll be going along and you'll, you'll find some research you didn't know about when you're near the end of the article and you're reading through the research like, oh my gosh, this would go great back in like topic one or the third thing I wrote about. And then I wind up going that back and that takes so long <laughs> because of the footnotes. You know, you stick something at the beginning of the article and now you got to push down 30 footnotes and redo them. And on the web, well, you said you work with webs, web software, you know how that is. It's, mm. it's not like you're working with software that will automatically insert a nice footnote for you. You got to do it manually. But that's kind of how I do it. Awesome. And uh, of course, we talked a lot about... Uh... You mentioned also that you've written articles on other subjects like uh, food and alcohol and such. Uh, but why did you originally decide to focus specifically on early modern medicine? Actually, food was part of it from the very beginning. I thought this is important. Health and well-being is important to surgery. But, okay, so why did I choose surgery is what you're asking me? Mm, Just yes. Like, okay, so... So I decided I'm going to, we're back to Key West again. We're always going to go back to Key West. That was the seminal event, I guess. And I wanted to do something in the crew. I wanted to be able to present something that nobody else was presenting. And so I said, you know, what, what kind of things do you have? And they listed all the different people and what they were doing. And they didn't have a surgeon. And I thought, this is a technical subject. It, it has tools. I'm an engineer. I like tools. So I can acquire some tools and explain the tools. And that's why I chose the surgeon because it was kind of like as close as you could get to what I'd probably be doing as an engineer. I might have been, you know, like working on the ship or something, like that, but that didn't interest me. I wanted a topic that had 
more to it, if that makes any sense. And I'm not saying right. there's nothing to do. How do you repair a ship? But I was really more interested in something like that. So that's why I chose it. Mm. No, so it's sort of the uh, very personal technical uh, expertise and uh, knowledge. Mm -hmm. That's actually quite interesting. But do you do you know anything about the about the modern medical practice or surgery? I actually have a very little knowledge of modern medicine, which is kind of funny because you get a lot of doctors and nurses that come up to the display because this is something they're interested in. And so I'll give my presentation. I'll say, you know, this is how you do this procedure. And they'll say, well, today we do it like this and we do that and we have this and we have that. And so I learn things from people coming up to my display who want to learn things. So I do know a little bit, but it's all been taught to me by people coming to my display and wanting to understand it. And I think in a way that gives me a perspective that if you were a modern medical person, you wouldn't have because you would be colored by what is. And I, I'm i like focused exclusively on what was. And I stay away from stuff that's later period for that reason. No, that's probably quite a valuable insight, actually, because you're sort of living more into the into the role of what it would have been for a surgeon in the period itself, rather than a modern expert, you know, going going back in time, I suppose. But now that you've sort of learned a bit more from all the all of these uh, medical modern medical experts, mm -hmm. what would you say is or are the biggest differences between um, early modern and uh, well modern medicine? Oh, gosh, <laughs> there's so much. Yeah. I mean, they didn't really understand the body even very well back then. They, they were just learning about how the body works, that germs weren't understood at all. I mean, that kind of stuff was just foreign to them. So, yeah, I, it's, it's completely different. They were guessing half the time. And some of the things you read are just, just bizarre. I mean, almost like some of it is almost like witchcraft. It really is. Some of it just makes no sense. They, uh, the, whole, the whole thing about bleeding people, uh, that was a big deal back then. Almost any procedure involved bloodletting. And the reason was that we got to balance the humors. And of course, today, we know there's no such thing as humors. But it was key to what they were doing back then. Was it right by today's standards? No, definitely not. But it's what they knew. And I always try to tell people that, you know, people look at you and they say, well, that procedure is horrible. And it's like, yeah. And in 300 years, they're going to come back and look at us and say, look, they did radiation on people with cancer. Wasn't that horrible? See, it's just a matter of, you know, what they knew, what they understood. And I always try to impress that upon. I learned that from Star Trek, by the way. <laughs> there was an episode oh, the where the doctor was some lady that was in the hospital and they were telling the procedure that he did on her, that the doctors had done on her. He said, that's barbaric. And I thought, that's how someone looks at my, what I'm talking about today. But yeah, it did, it's just so different. I mean, there's so many things they didn't understand. They just learned about circulation of the blood, like, I don't know, 40, 50 years before the period I'm showing. So, I mean, there's so many things that they, they thought the liver was like the center of the body at one point, and that was still kind of there. A lot of people hadn't let go of the old techniques. So, yeah. yeah the very liver different. school. Very different. Uh, would you say there's any any form of merit to the uh, these old practices? You know, one of the things that interests me, and it, it's funny because in the beginning, I stayed as far away from it as possible because I didn't understand it, but it's the medicine. And there are a lot of medicines out there that they're, they're basically herbs and spices and things like that. And I think they have some technical merit. I mean, I don't think they're going to be as valuable in some cases as modern medicine today, but I'm not sure all the modern medicine today, the medicines they give, you know, the pills and potions are really as valuable as they're presented. But on the other hand, some of them are fantastic. Uh, being a type one diabetic, uh, I really appreciate insulin, which is something they didn't have then. In fact, if I lived then, I'd 
probably have been dead by the age of four. But it's, yeah, I think the, the herbs and stuff, I think there's a lot of information there that we don't know. And it doesn't pay anybody to research it because if you found out that some herb was valuable in healing X, whatever that might be, you couldn't capitalize on it. And so from you know the capitalist system point of view, there's no real incentive to go and do that. And there are people still that, that even medical professionals that do kind of look into this. And I, I had a nurse send me a bunch of articles from a magazine that she got, a professional magazine she got. And every month they would talk about an herb and what possible uses it might have. And kind of what, here's what it was in the past. Here's what it might be able to do today. It's, again, usually not as effective as some of the modern medicines, which can better target things, but it still has value. And I think that's one of the big things. It, and I, it's funny because, like I say, I, I stayed away from it for so long because there's some people out there that think that you don't need anything but natural healing. And I don't bite into that, too, because obviously who I am I would be dead if I relied exclusively on natural healing, but I do see that there's value in it. And when I started to research it, I really got interested in it. And that was the first like big article on a number of different things like I'm doing with the foods where you're talking about individual foods. I talked about all the individual medicines mentioned by the the surgeons, the sea surgeons that mentioned them. Because there's, you know, there's like John Woodall has 220 or 250 medicines he talks about. And I talk about everyone and everyone that John Atkins talk about and everyone that John Moyle, these are all surgeons who wrote books from the period that were sea surgeons. And I talk about all their medicines because I think it's, it became really interesting to me. To give, to give some sort of context, because you, you mentioned these like 200 medicines and that might, might sort of be a bit hard to grasp. So could you give an example of one very strange and like complicated medicine and one example of a very mundane, simple medicine. This was the kind of question I told you I didn't want you to oh, I'm sorry. But... I need my website to do this kind of stuff. Um, well, there were a lot of, I mean, when I talk about medicines, there are a lot of combination medicines. John, John Woodall had like, I, I don't know if it was 220, I think it was at least 220 medicines, but a lot of more combinations of things. But one of the big parts of humor theory was enemas. And he would create these really exotic enemas with all kinds of stuff in it. They, they had a medicine, which I will not recall the name of, but it had like 25 different ingredients in it. And they would just mash all of these things together and say, well, this must cure, this is gonna almost be a cure-all. But mundane, I mean, you name it, they would literally go out in the fields. They would send people out in the fields to just pick different herbs. And then they would come back and then they would try to figure out, well, what would this herb be good for? Because they thought every spice and herb had to have a healing value. And particularly the people that lived in a certain area, the spices and herbs that grew in their area would be most applicable to them. So... I didn't answer your question mainly because I can't think of any names because you put me on the spot. No, I'm sorry. It's it's very interesting though what you say, like this sort of idea that that is sort of like some sort of intrinsic logic to to nature and the universe. Where like yeah, if you live in a certain area, there are going to be medicines, natural medicines for your condition. You know, one that's mundane that it's common and actually has healing properties is honey. Mm. Honey was a, a big part of a lot of the. And when I say that 25 combination medicine, that had, I'm pretty sure it had honey in it. Mm. But there, anything, I mean, flowers, plants, anything they thought would have some kind of healing ability. In fact, they thought more of them as medicine than they did as food. People didn't tend to eat as much in the way of plants as food at that time. They were far more interested in meat as a food stuff. So it's, kind of funny you get a lot more medicinal values from the plants of the period from the books at least that's how it reads in the books right and uh, you mentioned it a bit so i i hope it won't be a uh, too too much of a private question but you you talked of course about your diabetes 
So I'm curious, how did they know about the existence of diabetes in the early modern age? And if so, how did they, how did they treat it? Uh, they tried to treat it through diet. I, I've never found enough material to actually write an article on it. Mm. Interesting enough. That and going back to what I'm trying to do, I'm talking about C surgery. Diabetes, what they call diabetes, I think is what we would call type 2 diabetes. Mm. There are two types of diabetes. There's the kind I have, which is type 1. It's called juvenile diabetes. And basically, your body completely attacks the islets of your hand, and it just makes it so they can't make any insulin at all. And those people would have just died. So a lot of what I think they're talking about, in fact, I'm almost certain what they're talking about in the books that I find diabetics is type 2, which is adult onset. And that's usually as a result of your body kind of breaking down and you're not able to produce as much insulin. So they can control that through diet. And as I recall, I have not looked into it very far, but as I recall, that was how they tried to do it. But it, we wouldn't have found it on a ship because most of the people on the ship were young. And if they would have had diabetes, I think it would have been problematic. They probably would have left the service of the ship. So I was trying to you know, keep my focus. It's like people talk about uh, pregnancy. Somebody wanted me to write about pregnancy. And like, there weren't very many women on ships. You're probably not going to have to deal with pregnancy. And if you were, you were going to go on land. So no, I'm not going to write about pregnancy. It's just not relevant to what I'm trying to do here. And I kind of feel that way about diabetes too. Mm. Right. Do you feel like it, it would be something for like out of your own interest, out of your own experience or something you would like to explore further? Actually, probably not. I probably would have done so at this point. Um, you know, it's funny. You, you, you talk like it's a personal thing and I don't regard it that mm. as at all. I, it's a part of me and mm. I, you, you learn to live with it and you also kind of learn to set it aside so that it doesn't become a problem. You know what I mean? Yeah, uh, of course. It, it's better to just, I deal with it. And I mean, today we've got such fantastic technology with the uh, insulin pumps. And I can tell you right now what my blood sugar is, if you're interested, because I could. <laughs> Not exactly. Huh? Not exactly. Yeah, I didn't think you'd want to hear yeah. it. But you know what I'm saying? I mean, mm, it, yeah. I am aware of it. I don't dwell on it. Mm. Of course. Um, so sort of more on the, uh, as a sort of sort of ending question on the, on the website, what is, uh, what is next for the pirate surgeon? Well, I, I kind of told you before I dropped off doing it. I, mm. uh, I was sort of thinking like I needed to move on to something else. That And the problem with the website has been, is recently has been, as near as I can tell, people aren't reading it. And I think that's part because it's old style web and a lot of people are using their phones. And I think part of it's just because now we're all into like this much. We want to read this much. And then we're done. We want to we want to see some short thing or a video or something like that. And I'm not trying to put down videos, mind you, but um, I wonder that people are reading it. It's kind of interesting that you had told me that people are talking about it. What was it on Discord? Yeah, yeah, so, I've seen some people mention it. Yeah, I'm not even familiar with Discord. Hmm. But um, actually. Though, because you were interested in it, I went back and I, I was writing, when I left off, I was writing about uh, proteins, mm. uh, not fish proteins. That was where I left off. I was going to talk about, you know, like beef and uh, rabbits and pork and milk and all that stuff. And I'd started to write it when I finally looked at it and said, you know, I need to, I need to find something else to do. And I actually went back and started doing it again because I was talking to you. So if there is to be a next, it's going to be about uh, non-fish proteins. And then it'll be fish proteins. And after that, it should really be the article that I should have written first, which is, what did they eat at sea? It, I, I have not really written that article about foods. I got into foods, and I knew foods was going to be just this huge slog. And I kept putting it off and putting it off and putting. And finally, I thought, you know, I need to sit down and write this. And 
I started out with different parts of it, like, you know, how did they acquire food? There's a whole article on that, which is, I think has proved to be very popular, actually. Of all the things I wrote about food, that seems to be the most popular. Like, you know, pirates would steal it and they would fish and they would hunt and just there's a number of ways they would acquire food. And I try to do it very analytically. I actually give charts, you know, these, here's how many Navy sailors uh, drink milk, for example. That's what I'm writing about right now is milk. And here's how many privateers, and here's how many merchants, and here's how many pirates, and here's how many explorers. And, I, you know, I try to break it all down and say, this is what I found in the sea, the sea journals from the Times. Because there are quite a number of them out there, and I just think that's fascinating. So I got into all the background first before I was going to write about what did sailors actually eat? And you have to divide that. It's like, what did they eat at sea? And then what did they eat when they were on land, which becomes a bit odd because you don't hear as much about what they did on the land. You don't find as many accounts, but they do talk about it. So I was going to write about that. But I wanted to do like the individual foods first so I could refer back and say, well, you know, they ate cabbage and then, it, you know, create a link to the article on cabbage for people who are interested in cabbage, which I can't imagine are that many, but you never know. You know, I think I think there's actually going to be, at least in my community, there's going to be a lot of interest in it. Um, I do tend to, like, when I do live streams, I do t actually tend to get a lot of questions about food. Someone asked oh, me someone asked me if I was going to write a cookbook, and it's like, <laughs> no. <laughs> and I know, that, I know actually there is a, a cookbook in French, at least, on pirate recipes. But I'm also, when you, when you talked about non-animal proteins, I'm thinking about... Um, uh, the sort of Mediterranean, the Spanish and Portuguese, they I think they ate a lot of, um, what are they called, chickpeas, calavances, as they call them back then. And, you know, it's funny, you bring that up, and I put them, I was looking at, particularly at beans, mm. which is what you're talking about, and I'm looking at beans, and not excluding green beans, which are clearly a vegetable, but like red beans and black beans and chickpeas and all of those things. And I'm thinking, okay, these are protein and they're vegetable. They have elements of both. Where do I put them? And they wound up in vegetable because I just decided that's where most people are probably going to think of them being. So they've already been written. If you go to my webpage and you go, it's the first section, which this is terrible. I can't tell you what it's called, but it, it has a separate section in the first um part of the website if you look down all of my links are on the right hand side of the web page if you go there and you go down to the bottom there's all just articles on food water and alcohol You're and right. there's there's a ton of them i mean there, there's i think there's probably for me there's a ton of them i say that there's probably like 15 different articles already there and i still haven't written the one that everybody wants to know which is what did they eat at sea because I thought, well, I want to get all these other ones so I can refer back to them, you know, so you got the background so you can you can understand because it's not as simple as, well, they ate this. At least I don't think it is because they ate a lot of different things. You know, it wasn't quite the, the horrible diet you think it was, mm -hmm. except they were out at sea for a long time and then they were stuck in a very particular diet. Mm -hmm. But yeah. There, there's probably more information on food than any other single topic on that website now. And I still haven't got to the one that I need to. <laughs> no, and of course with the... Do it uh, just to finish that. No, and of course with the, with the magic of video editing, I will be... Uh, later when I ed edit this, I will be able to uh, add like a picture of the website or a little video where it scrolls down to show people where the, where the articles are located. So... Uh, yeah, if you just take a picture of it. I mean, it... There is, and I, this is terrible. I started writing about locations because I was mm -hmm. interested in pirate locations, which are typically islands. Mm -hmm. well, that's what I found, at, or maybe that's just what interested me. And so I wrote about several islands in the Caribbean and the uh, around the, the other side of, basically around North and South America. Mm -hmm. There's like four different islands where there's a lot of information about food. And I was going to do that for the East Indies as well, and, and and the Atlantic in between the continents. And I just, I realized it was just 
taking me too far away from the main topic and I never finished them. So at the bottom, there's like four Caribbean or five Caribbean islands, I think in the Navy, how they did their food. And then I stopped. So even if I go back and finish the article on what they ate, I got to go back to that. And there's, I believe there's like 12 or 15 islands I wanted to talk about. Madagascar, for example, was a huge place for them. And what did they eat there? And, you know, what, what was what was there at that time? What was available? So I don't want to get too far off topic here. No, the a sort of um, the the sort of big final question that I have is, and it's also kind of includes a sort of bigger statement. And that is, of course, you um, you played a sort a, a character, the the surgeon who has been press ganged, of course, or kidnapped by by the pirates, but. Um, What's kind of interesting that struck me about surgeons is, of course, they had, um, on paper at least, so they had a sort of a lot, a lot of potential to have a lot of power, you know, owing to their education and also owing to just, uh, you know, ha literally holding like lives in, in their hands. Right. Um, yeah. And even, you know, just being able to exercise power by, you know, saying, oh, you need a bloodletting, let me do a bloodletting for you. But, um, and I, I don't know if you read, uh, I don't know if you read Captain Blood, the uh, Sabatini novel. Um, no, I, yeah, I there is. Fiction. Yeah, there is this. There is this scene there where he, um, uh, where he does a. He's a. He's a captive of a plantationer, I think, and he does a. He does a bloodletting on the plantationer to to specifically to weaken him, to put him in a weakened state so he can exploit it. Um, and now it's all. I'm, I'm coming to the question shortly, but. Uh, if he, a surgeon, right? Captain Blood was a surgeon. Yeah, Captain Blood, Peter Blood, he's a yeah, surgeon right. initially, so he has that. Um, but if you compare it to like someone like Long John Silver, who's like a ship's cook, who's way more famous, uh, and everyone sort of knows, like, yeah, the pirate cook, it's almost like very sort of apple and pie. But do you think like the pirate surgeon that that it's an unexplored sort of character archetype? You know, it's funny you ask that because I had heard, and I don't remember when this was, but. I had heard they were going to make a version of Captain Blood a couple years ago. Mm. And I thought, you know what? That might actually lead people to be interested in surgery if they do it right. And it, there would be a renewed interest in my website. So I was kind of excited about that. But yes, I think there is, and particularly with Captain Blood, because he's probably the best known fictional character which is funny I say that I've not seen any of the movies. I just know he was a surgeon because I was reading about upcoming movies they were talking about. And I thought, oh, that would that could possibly lead to more interest in this character. But yeah, I think so. I mean, you look at uh, Master and Commander. Mm. You've got the captain there, and then you've got the guy who's the surgeon who I thought was just fascinating. And it was so well done in the movie. I, I They're coming out with a new one, I think. Okay. I'm kind of hoping... They uh, they stick to what they've done because they did such a nice job with that. I thought the the surgeries they showed, from my understanding of them, were pretty well done. I mean, much better well done than a lot of things. And I actually, believe it or not, somebody hired me to work on a pirate TV show. Except the the only part of the hire that I didn't get was any actual payment. So hired was sort of a misnomer, I guess. But, yeah, you got uh, press ganged again. I guess so. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so uh, anyway, I was I was working with these people on this show, and they wanted me to do an amputation. So I, you know, I started writing this up, and the guy said, "Well, we need it tomorrow." <laughs> so, I, well, what do you want? Go to my website. It's right there. It explains everything. And I said, he said, well, I want a step by step. So I spent that evening putting together a step by step for him. Like, you know, here's 11 steps that you would go through. Well, in the meantime, they decided to shoot it earlier. I don't know what. So the actor went and read my website, <laughs> which is what I told him to do in the first place. I send him the step by step and he says, oh, we don't need it anymore. And I thought, okay. And then I didn't hear anything. So then he comes back a couple of months later and said, well, we're going to do a head surgery. We'd like you to help us on that. And said, you didn't pay me for the amputation stuff that I put together for you. Oh, well, just send me your social security number and we'll take care of that. And I'm like, okay, we're done here. <laughs>
Yeah, that's so I didn't get paid, and they never got their head surgery. And I heard what they used in that uh, that show was very poorly done. So I didn't have an article on head surgery on my website at that time. Has this ever happened? Because now I got kind of curious. Has anything similar, not in the negative sense, but have you ever been like hired or contacted for some sort of project like this before, which you participated in? That was the only media project I was. I've been actually brought in to speak at libraries and stuff. Um, I, you know, I, you'd get a token payment. I, you know, so I guess I've been paid. Some people have actually given money to me doing the presentation. I don't ask for it. I don't. I don't want to say I don't want it, but I really. That's not why I'm there. You know, I'm not there to to get tips or whatever. I'm there because I like doing this. I like researching it. If if you were going to pay me for the amount of time I've invested in this, you'd be broke. I mean, it's just thousands and thousands of hours of research in this. And that's not why I do it. I do it because I really do it because I like to write and I like to research. I like both of those things. And I like to set things straight. You know, this is this is actually how it happened. And that's what kind of fascinated me about the, the piracy in the beginning was when we were on Pirates Info back in 2002, 2003, people would come on and they'd have these just totally incorrect ideas about pirates. And you could go through and you could say, look, here, here's this and this and this and explain with resources why what they're saying isn't correct. And a lot of people, they don't even want to hear it. They're just going to go on believing it, which is fine, whatever. You know, we're all individually, we do what we want. But I want to be able to say, well, here it is. Here's the research that supports it. Do what you want with it. No, and I think uh, that's a sort of excellent note to uh, uh, to end on. Um, I do have some uh, sort of uh, small fun questions to sort of wind down, wind down on. Um, okay. And the first one is, uh, do you have a favorite pirate? You know, it, it'll probably always be Captain Nisone, fictional or not, but uh, I'm trying to remember his name. Oh, the guy that was stranded on Juan Fernandez Island, Alexander Selkirk. He is, he was a surgeon, sort of. I, I don't get the impression he completed his training, but he lived on what Juan Fernandez Islands. It, it's actually a group of islands. They called it just one island. And I was so interested in, he was the guy that was stuck there for four years and some months. And I was so interested in that for my 50th birthday, because you know, that's 10 years past my, my uh, due date. Was supposed to be dead at 40 right and uh, i thought i want to go see his island and it is not an easy island to go visit let me tell you but i did get out there and i did get to see the place the island where he stayed they don't know exactly where he stayed on the island but it was fascinating there were like 800 people live there it's this little island way off the shore of chile and uh i, I was able to get out there and see it and i I went there because Alexander Selkirk, or Selkirk, he uses both names. Um, he's called by both names, I should say. But he was there. So he's probably, and he's technically a buccaneer. He's not a pirate. But I just thought he was really interesting. And he's probably my favorite pirate surgeon, buccaneer surgeon. I think you sort of answer might have answered the question the question now, but also relating to you, you talked a bit about pirate locations before. But which pirate location would you say is your favorite? Actually, that is not my favorite. Um, I just wanted to go there because he was there, Madagascar. Mm. I had that all scheduled for 2020, and something happened in 2020 that kind of put the kibosh on it. That was uh, COVID. Mm. actually had already paid the deposit to do it and uh, I still haven't got that back <laughs> and 
Yeah, I would. I think probably Madagascar is. You did a whole thing on Madagascar. I yeah, believe. I did. It's the it's the longest video so far, I think. I just did on Ed Fox's. Uh, I should go out and watch it. I I tend to shy away from watching the pirate documentaries, but like I say, I someone put me on to yours because you actually do list sources, hmm. which I think is phenomenal. And please continue to do that. Yeah. Because. So often the videos, people say things and people think, well, that's got to be a fact. It's in a video. It's like, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> he's using the, the general history, which isn't in all entirely true, where you don't do that. And so I I should I probably need to go look at your your stuff a little bit more closely. Oh, but I just do it again, just time stuff on the web because then you start thinking, oh, this is fantastic. I can use this. And then you research it and you find out, well, that's not exactly right. <laughs> uh, I, I realize now, like I, I wrote this question beforehand, but I think there's uh, a question which would be a bit more relevant. And I hope I'm not putting you on the spot here, but which which surgeon's tool from the period would you say is your favorite? Hmm. They don't tend to think of them as favorites. <laughs> they tend to think of them as useful. So which one? It'll which one would you say is the because you you bring out those nippers? I love to ask people, what do you think this was for? Mm. Because they're always wrong, and it, then they get curious. Well, what is it for? The nippers that nip off the finger, and I mean they're so simple, but it's probably the cranium tools. Um, no, no, I don't know why I didn't think of this. John Woodall had a bone saw that he pictured in his book. And I have been wanting that bone saw ever since I saw it back in 2007 or 8. It's 2008, because I didn't have this book in 2007. And it's just this beautiful bone saw. And you will find, you have to go to the Facebook page. There is a picture of me, and it's actually from early 17th century uh Dutch event, believe it or not. A guy had made one of these by hand, and there's a picture of me holding it. And I'm not in proper pirate gear. I'm in early 17th Dutch gear because that was the event. And I mainly went just to see it. And this guy had that bone saw. Yeah, that's kind of my holy grail that I've always wanted. I now have three bone saws, so I have nothing to whine about. But I would love to have one of those John Woodall bone saws. And I've been coveting it ever since I saw it, and I don't know why I didn't think of it. There are pictures of it on my web page in some place that I couldn't possibly tell you the, the original John Woodall sketch. But if you look online, you can find it. It's just a gorgeous piece. It's absurd. You would never want to actually use it. It's like this long. I mean, it's huge, but it's 25 inches, I think, end to end. That's my favorite surgical tool because it's just beautiful like art right uh as a as a final note uh can you remind us of uh, who you are and uh, where we can find your work well i'm, I'm technically i'm raphael mission uh, mark Tiho is my real name and you find it at piratesurgeon.com awesome well um, thank you so much for taking the time out of your day out of your lovely sunday to come and share your story about the uh, piratesurgeon.com you're welcome. And thank you for being persistent. I know this wasn't the easiest thing to set up. Oh, I've, I've had worse. Believe me, I've had worse. Ladies and gentlemen, that was the interview with PirateSurgeon.com. Uh, you can find all of the necessary links in the, to his work in the video description and a pinned comment, as per usual. Uh, I really recommend giving his website a look. The articles there are just excellent. Uh, anyway, uh, I hope you enjoyed the interview uh, as much as I did. Uh, if there's um, any figures you would like me to interview in the future, uh, please tell me in the comments and um, maybe Santa can make it happen. Otherwise, uh, do consider supporting Golden Gunpowder by becoming a channel member, a Patreon supporter or making a one-time donation. I'll be seeing you soon. <laughs>